last conversation, you presented a very interesting concept that you called COVID-19 phases matrix, where you broke down the process in three stages. Uh, at the time of the recording in April, we're in uh, stage one, with the pandemic still growing and curves starting to flatten. Since then, we managed to reduce the number of cases, uh, opening parts of the economy, increasing the availability of testing kits, uh, returning back to the offices and opening schools, as well as the growth of the treatment as medics are learning how to treat COVID-19 patients. However, with the recent news, we see the emergence of, uh, of cases once again, which might lead to an, an additional round of lockdowns. So it seems that we are kind of in the, in the middle where about to go into phase two, and now we seems to be going back into phase one again. So with the regards to your metrics, where do you see us now? And how should we look and define the current situation when we are, when, when we are trying to analyze where we are heading? Well, that's a good question, Martin. It's a good way to start. Um, the, the reason I created that matrix the first time was really to try to create some sort of stylized model uh, understand a little bit what the path might look like. It was not to try to represent exactly what would happen or to predict as such, but to really give a, a roadmap. And I would say a few things. I think I, I revisited it recently. And in fact, I do think it's actually following uh, somewhat to my surprise, a lot of the things that I put in there. Um, I do think we're in phase two. I do think we've progressed in certain regards. So I would say a few big picture comments, okay? I think the first thing we've learned since we last spoke is, and it's been said that, you know, in the beginning we learned how to die with the virus and now we're learning how to live with the virus. And I think that is a really important comment because we've kind of gotten to the place where we understand this is a part of our lives for the time being, we have to manage it. We can't stay locked in our homes all the time. We can't shut down every business, but we have to be smart about the way we do things. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, again, this is a model. So phase one, which I do think we've, we've largely come out of, um, was to me primarily about what I would call capacity building. I think when this first hit, I think we had serious capacity shortages in healthcare, in both in terms of facilities, hospital beds, uh, PP equipment, treatments, all kinds of things, right? So there was a lack of capacity. There was a lack of capacity in the, the businesses to readjust to a new reality, to figure out how to deal with suppressed demand to try to figure out how to keep for governments to how to keep people um, gainfully uh, employed or at least gainfully paid for the time being. And so there were all these things. There was a lack of capacity in financial markets initially and central banks stepped in. So I think the capacity issue was critical in the first phase. And I do think in a lot of regards, we've actually moved beyond that. Um, there are still many, many cases. So the, the disease is still very much with us, but hospitals have more capacity. There's more equipment, there's more ventilators, there's more, a lot of things that we didn't have in the beginning. The markets have been stabilized somewhat by the central banks. And I gather we'll probably talk more about that. Um, stimulus plans have helped stabilize the populations to a certain extent and the labor markets. So that kind of happened in the beginning. Phase two, was to me, I would call it more the um, capability phase, right? Once you secure capacity, then it's building capabilities, right? And so if you look at phase two, the way I had kind of sketched it out, it was about learning about how to manage the virus, learning about treatments, learning about how best to utilize uh, medical capacity, learning for businesses, how to adapt to this new environment. And some did and some didn't. But I think we're in that second phase right now. I think we're in a, a capability building phase and we're learning how to, as I said earlier, live with this virus, okay? One caveat, uh, when I originally did this, I did put an asterisk and say, you know, this will be different for every country. And I think that's true, right? So I think this matrix, you can't assume it works for all countries. They will be in different phases of, of where they are. They will be at different levels of take up and so on. But I do think in general, it, it is a pretty good picture. Where I would qualify it is, you know, I put a 
pretty optimistic phase three as summer 2021. Um, where there'd be a vaccine and life would get back to a new normal, whatever that is. And I would say, based on everything we're learning now, uh, one, I would qualify that a bit. I don't think it will be a, a break in, in one summer. It will not go from end of pandemic to completely new normal. I think there will be a process. It's now clear that vaccines hopefully will be available soon, but then the distribution of them and the production of them will take a long time. Some people may choose not to take them and so on. So I think phase three will be more extended in terms of what I laid out in terms of phase two. So back to where we are today. So I think there's a few things one could say. One is, you know, there will be flare ups and that was mentioned in the matrix. So you can still be in this phase where you've got capacity, which is important because it helps prevent real crises, right? Secondly, you, you're building your capability, you're, you're learning, you're adapting, you have new treatments, you have new ways of, of managing and you can still have flare ups. And we're seeing it in parts of Europe. We're certainly seeing it in the States. And so, you know, you have to remember that at the end of the day, the virus has not changed. The virus is the same. The virus goal is to infect as many hosts as possible. And until either there's a vaccine that's widely used or there's herd immunity, which we are on some path to, but we're nowhere near, um, it is not surprising that there will be flare ups. Okay. And so, you know, we still have less than 50%, in some places, well less than 50% of populations that have been infected and have some antibodies. So, you know, we're somewhere in that second phase. We will have flare ups. Um, having said that, we are in a better position to manage that. If I talk about, I'm sitting in Geneva now and I live near the hospital. And, and the last time we spoke, there were ambulance sirens all around the clock and we could hear them. And you don't hear that as much anymore. Mm -hmm. And the death rate in Switzerland has been reduced virtually to zero. So um, we are learning how to, as I said earlier, live with this virus. That's where I think we are. I think we're in the second phase and all that I put in the matrix, which we won't go through now, I think still broadly applies. And I think for people that are listening and want to you know, kind of utilize this information, take this matrix, apply it to whatever country you're looking at, and then make your own judgments about where you think certain industries are or where you think the country is. And, and hopefully it's helpful as a, as a little bit of a roadmap. Yes, and for everyone who is interested in the matrix that we're talking about, you can find it in the link to the in the description to, of this video. Uh, it's an incredible uh, matrix that Greg has put together back in the April, and it did, as Greg says, worked out really, really well. And it's a great analysis tool. Uh, yes, uh, and the, I think one of the, the things that I wanted to mention is that from maybe going from a global lockdown, we might uh, hopefully go into more local ones. Because, because we can identify the areas of the most parks like they do in United Kingdom right now. They close towns separately, but they don't cl close the whole United Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean it, it's, it's a very good point. And so the countries that have been most successful, uh, primarily in Asia, at dealing with this virus, if you take South Korea or if you take Taiwan, um, what they have done is not lock down. They have quickly identified cases, quickly identified small clusters, quickly done the right contract, contact testing, uh, tracing. And from that, they've been able to isolate and shut down uh, or, the, or contain these outbreaks. Mm. And so that is the path of the future, not to lock down the entire economy. You know, it's 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 like having to kill an ant and having an elephant step on it every time. Yeah. It's it's overdone. So we need to be more precise. And I'm glad you brought that up. Agreed. Um, let's talk about uh, finances a little bit. Um, you, I know that you work with uh, in terms okay. of uh, with, with uh, your clients a lot. And can you talk a little bit about the process that you go through in terms of getting to uh, to the asset allocation recommendations? Like, what is the process both from internalizing and then synthesizing the information that is out there? Because we know it's so much information, and then actually putting it in a financial directive. Right. Okay. Well, again, good question and. You know, I would say, look, asset allocation is neither a new concept, it's a concept that's well discussed, uh, and it's not magic. There's no magic. 
you know, there's ways of approaching it. And I think, you know, you mentioned all the information out there. I think the best asset allocation for any client, you know, and I'm uh, focused on wealth management, so I'm focused on particular clients. I'm not an asset manager. I don't have funds and I'm not, you know, looking at a pool of assets. So if I look at client needs, it has to start within and not without, right? So you don't begin with the world and the markets, and then you have to begin with the person, right? So the first questions are very basic things. You know, it's understanding a person's kind of life plan and objectives. You know, where are you? What do you want to achieve? What are your goals? Where are you today, right? So that's a starting point, you know, and then within that, you look at the family structure, you look at the business structure, you look at the, the horizon that they have and so on, okay? Then from that, you start to get some sense of what assets might be available, what the purpose is behind those. And in order to do that, what I like to do is start with liquidity management and I look at leverage a little bit. So what do you need to live? For some clients, it's nothing. It's, look, the, the, this portfolio is not something I live off. I just want to put it in a safe place. And so that gives you an idea of what liquidity you need. For other clients, you know, they need to have income streams from that. So mm -hmm. if you understand that, it helps you do two things. One, it helps you adjust what sort of yield and what sort of income generation you want to have. And secondly, it helps you understand how liquid or illiquid you, you might be able to go with the portfolio, what things you could invest in that have kind of a longer horizon um, where you're unlikely to have to sell out because we want to avoid situations where people get overextended or over leveraged and then suddenly have a crisis because there wasn't enough forethought. So, so the first thing is liquidity. The second thing is, you know, what is the purpose of the funds? And how hands-on does a client want to be? Some clients want to have a pool of assets to play with, to really be involved with, uh, either in public or private markets, uh, which is another part of the discussion. And some of it is really kind of so-called safe money. And, and again, where you invest that depends a little bit on what your horizon is, what your risk tolerance is, and to a certain extent, what the state of the world is, um, right? So that is kind of the process um, you you go through. And I don't need to tell the listeners here about, you know, there's a 60-40 portfolio, which is a balanced portfolio, and you want to do that because bonds and, and equities are in principle meant to be not correlated and so on. I don't think that's the purpose of our podcast. I think people understand that. But in terms of your question, that is the process I like to go through so that whatever client I'm talking with really feels this is right for me, you know, and you have to ask tough questions and you have to do the work, right? There's no shortcut uh, to doing it, you know. Banks and asset managers will have standard portfolios and they're all kind of, you know, from conservative to risky to, you know, to high risk and so on. Uh, that's fine, but you have to begin with the client and then back into where they might fit in rather than start with, with, with that. Okay. So I think, and in that process, you learn a lot of things. And if you do it right, uh, then you avoid surprises down the road. It doesn't mean the allocation will yield exactly what you want, just to be mm -hmm. clear. It doesn't mean you sit and you agree the client needs 10% per year and you say, fine. And then it just <laughs> delivers, <laughs> but at least you will be in the right ballpark. And I think, um, you know, this is very important because often, you know, there's there's a regulatory reason to do this, right? So banks and other regulated uh, asset managers have to do this because they have to demonstrate to the regulator they've gone through a process, they have the right forms filled in and so on so that they don't get sued, which does happen, um, for, for the investments the clients have made. And I would argue that that is formal part of the process but there is a stricter part of the process where you really understand the needs and ensure that they get matched and not to please the regulators, but to in fact address what the client really wants uh, and really needs. And those two might be different things too. Got it. Yeah, you, you, basically you start with the client. Uh, you, you don't, uh, there's no yeah. size fit all. You, you fit all, you just uh, right. you need to understand the client and then you know, tailor everything you do according to their needs. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you an example, you know. 
Uh, so one of my clients, we had a particularly good year a couple of years ago and things worked out very well. And he was really pleased. And he told somebody else who was a very high net worth person uh, how happy he was. And that person asked if I could share with him the portfolio so he could you know, learn and potentially become a client. And, and I refused. And what I did was instead I said, that portfolio was created under particular circumstances for a particular person. I'm very happy to have a discussion with you and try to create the right portfolio for your needs. But simply sending you a copy of what I did for something else, as much as I would like to try to get you know, your business, I'd like to work with this particular person, I'm not going to do that because it's not correct. And that's where I think we need to be professionals. You know, We need to basically stick to our principles that it is a personal thing and it does have to be done properly and it has to be focused on each individual client. And they're all very, very different. Makes sense. Um, so talking about f finances and markets, uh, these are some of the craziest markets that we ever seen and experienced and probably uh, that people have navigated. Uh, could you please talk a little bit about how you navigated those markets and what has changed in the asset allocation standpoint for your clients that you work with? Um, well, I don't know that I've navigated them. I think I'm still navigating them as everybody else is. Um, yeah, the, look, the, the, the markets, I mean, if you, if you take a long-term view of markets, they're not that crazy, right? You know, they look crazy if you look at them day to day. And I encourage people not to do that. I tell my clients, please don't wake up in the morning and look at CNN and look at the market movements because that's not investing. That's 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 getting distracted. So in, in these markets, and when you say these markets, I, I, we're talking about, I guess, this year. So kind of in a COVID type environment, I think there's a few a few basic principles. And we talked about this in April and I had given you a checklist that I had put together for clients that just ensured you would go through some critical things. At that point, and it's changed, by the way, so the environment is different today than it was in April. In April, there was a lot of uh, leverage, it's tanking, there were risk, people were getting margin calls, there was a real worry about, about what the year might look like, people were trying to, to disinvest and so on. Um, things have stabilized from a market standpoint um, in a lot of ways. Right in those days, I remember forecast showing the S and P going down as low as 2,300. We're beyond that. It's been well over 3,000 for some time now, um, and and so the markets have stabilized to a certain extent. Um, what I have encouraged clients, to, and and there's reasons for that. You know, part of it is what the central banks have done, which has been very important. Part of it has been the stimulus, and part of it is the fact that the markets don't reflect the economies. I mean, there's a big difference in the U.S. between the stock market and the state of the economy. Stock market is a snapshot of a small group of companies, large public companies that have fared reasonably well through the, not all of them, but many of them. Um, and, you know, the markets are dominated by certain names like Apple, like Facebook, like Microsoft, and they've done well. And I've been happy to have clients money in those, in those uh, securities. But it's not an example of the economy. So in terms of what, what should you do, I think one is to stay invested. Um, I know people that were trying to get out of the market and back into the market. I didn't advise that. I didn't think it was a good strategy because we can never predict um, when the markets are coming back. And if you look at any kind of, uh, kind of time series, if you look at timing the markets, it's very seldom at an advantage to get in and out over the long term. You're much better off staying in the market. Um, so that was one one investment. I mean, money is cheap, so I you know I was encouraging people to stay invested, um, you know, and to stay in for the longer term. Secondly, um, you know, to look at market in terms of which companies would tend to fare well. You know, Nesim Taleb has a wonderful framework around fragility, you know, what are fragile, what are robust, and what are anti-fragile. And that's actually been very helpful. And I've looked at that a fair bit as a, as, a, as a guide, as I've looked at things. So what things are fragile? Well, we've seen it, you know, um, hospitality, tourism, retail have been terribly fragile in this 
COVID environment. And so you've seen a lot of uh, sell-offs there. What have been robust? Online businesses, technology business, certain healthcare businesses have been robust. They've stood up very well in there. And then there's some things that have been actually anti-fragile, you know? So things like Zoom and, and, and things like, um, you know, Amazon, things like, you know, we could talk at certain point about real estate, but there's certain mm. areas like warehousing and things that actually do better if COVID gets worse, right? That's the definition of anti-fragile, that, that when things get worse, they actually thrive, not only survive. So I think when you think about investing, I think you need to look at these different categories and try to understand how fragile is my portfolio? How anti-fragile is it? And how robust, and then and then you can start to make choices. So that has been one big thing. So stay invested, don't sit in a lot of cash, don't try to time the market, try to figure out how you can get to a place where you're more robust and anti-fragile. Yeah. And then there's another discussion, and again, this depends on the clients, but there's a big decision to make between going into some private investments, not just being in public markets. The public markets have been well bought, they're expensive. Um, and so one can definitely benefit, and I like to do this in portfolios, have some private investments, be they uh, private equity, private debt, uh, real estate, um, yeah, and, and hedge funds to a lesser extent. Um, and I think that's very important. Yeah, so that's been an important part of how I've looked at portfolios. And then, you know, within the diversification, geographic diversification, because there have been benefits to, for example, I got into China uh, in a bigger way a few months ago, and that's paid off. Well, uh, I did it to diversify, but it's the market's done quite well. Mm -hmm. So those are the things. But I think the public private uh, for high net worth clients, for retail clients, it's not, but for high net worth is, is an important thing. I know UBS has been promoting that and talking about that. And I think it's a, I think it's a good thing clients should think about. I think Taleb's framework, yeah. uh, just to help you, is, mm. is useful uh, for a lot of things in life. It's useful for us to think about our own lives. I'm a big fan of his, of his, of his writing and his, mm. his, his kind of models. Um, and again, it applies very well to finance. You just have to apply it um, correctly. It can be misapplied as well, but it's it's very powerful as a framework. Uh, just to uh, dive deep into this, uh, when you mentioned that like people should not stay in cash, that like, cash is cheap. And what do you think about uh, rate? Uh, so the stock markets for the last uh, thirty plus years have been just going up. Like stocks just go up. Some people say, and but if you value them in gold, they go down. Is it a good way to look at it, at it. Uh, is it bad way or is just misrepresentation that people throw in to uh, misguide us? It's the first time I've heard that, um, you know, and, and I mean, gold, look, gold is a, it, gold is a measure of the fear and uncertainty in the market. When fear and uncertainty are high, gold is up. So gold is at a very high price at the moment. Um, you know, gold uh, to, to to value things in terms of gold, I think is 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 misleading. I've never I've never heard it kind of put like that. I mean, gold in in you know, as I, I'm not a big proponent. I think some in some portfolios can make some sense, um, but we have to remember that in the end, gold is not an an earned asset. You know, it's a, it's it's you get no dividends from it. You get no uh, income stream from it. It's just a hedge uh, in a portfolio. And I think for that, some people like it, some people, you know, kind of uh, viscerally like it, mm. uh, but that, that's all it is. So I, again, uh, I, I, could, I, could, I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't see the, the logic and value in the stock market in terms of gold. When things get back to some kind of new normal, mm. gold will come back down mm. and that will change the picture uh, once again. Uh, so I think, I think but, but what I think is important actually it, more than more than that is again to go back to this public private uh, discussion because I think that uh, investors do benefit from having some private uh, holdings because if you're prepared and this goes back to the liquidity if you're prepared to give up a little bit of liquidity or a lot uh, you can create some 
uh, some alpha in the portfolio over the longer term. Uh, there are then a bunch of questions about how you get into that because it's not obvious which PE funds to get into. Some clients can't afford the minimums. And so there are groups, um, including my partners, Global Gate, that, that are, that are uh, well positioned to kind of help syndicate those things to allow clients to get a diversified set of private equity and private debt holdings at a lower uh, ticket price. Uh, because some of the major private equity firms, it's, it's $20, $30 million to get in, and that doesn't work for many clients. So I think private equity is a good thing. I think real estate, uh, again, the right properties um, today are, are good investments. And again, if you can get things that seem to be anti-fragile that will hold up well uh, in the pandemic, things like logistics, uh, warehousing, these are, these, are, these are good places to be. Mm. So I encourage, I encourage all the advisors listening and if any clients are listening to, to think about that, think how it fits into the portfolio, think how much to allocate to it and then figure out um, you know, what to do. And obviously if anybody has a question, they can come back to me. You know, they can go to my website, they can send me a note, I'm happy to, to post. Yes, that. all Greg details, you, again, you can find in the description. Uh, he's uh, uh, happy to answer your questions if they're clever enough. I guess as best as I can, and yeah. uh, you know, I'm not a helpline, but I can, I can certainly interact exactly. if there's a genuine need. Um, you meant uh, so, in terms of the real estate, I just uh, so you, you see it as a great hedge against inflation, right? As I understood it correct, so uh, it's it depends the... on the real estate. A, a lot of real estate uh, deals are hedged. You know, they're mm. inflation hedged, so it's built in. Um, mm. You know, so remember, there's inflation edge, and then there's correlation with the portfolio. So you, those are different things, and so there's different reasons you would put real estate in your portfolio. Yeah, and it depends on which things you're you're getting into. One has to be quite careful because there are pockets of the real estate market that are suffering, parts of you know the retail market, yep. parts of you know residential. Uh, so you have to be quite careful. So anybody that's looking to do that. I strongly suggest you, you get good advice on, on what you're going into. Got it. Um, yeah. So uh, one, uh, one of the turning points of what has happened in the last six to seven months, it has been the intervention of the Fed. Uh, America's mm -hmm. uh, cut its uh, rates nearly uh, back to the zero rate environment. Um, there's new guidance that suggests that we stay at zero, uh, zero rate environment for at least until 2023. We had $3 uh, trillion dollars injected through quantitative easing. Uh, there's a lot of people for calling maybe for more, uh, maybe it comes, maybe it doesn't. Uh, could you please talk a little bit about the role of the Fed and all of this? And really uh, from the light of the debate of the type of re recovery that we're going to have, as I'm sure you remember back in the March, uh, we have we, uh, there was a big debate on the internet and everywhere yes. about what type of eco uh, economic economic recovery that we're going to have. Like what type of the uh, letter is going to have? Is it V? Is it U shaped? And there's new letter that that is being thrown out K shaped recovery. Maybe you can cover that. And how do you see the role of Federal Reserve in this causing this like bifurcated response of the market? Mm. Well, there's a number of questions built into what you've just asked. So let's let's start with basic things. So uh, it's interesting to start with quantitative easing, right? Because we had quantitative easing after 2008, and it stayed in place for a long time. And a lot of people said that the economy could not survive without it because we'd gotten used to it. It was almost like, I mean, a, a drug addiction or something, you know? And then how does the economy get off it? Well. It did, right? Rates started to go back up again, and that was kind of revolutionary. And here we are, we're back down uh, mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So, but I think uh, there's a number of lessons here, which I think then will explain a little bit where the Fed is, I think, in terms of the economy and the markets. So, firstly, um, you know, if you look at 2008 compared to today, right, two big crises, very different, right? Very different. 2008 was fundamentally a crisis in the financial sector and the financial system. There were huge liquidity issues. 
there were imbalances there and the Fed needed to step in. Quantitative easing was fundamentally then to recapitalize banks and allow lending to occur and allow money to flow freely in the financial sector, right? The worry then was that the real sector would collapse if they didn't stabilize the financial sector. Some people agreed, some people didn't agree. Um, if we look at 2020, it's a very different crisis. It is not caused by instability as such within the financial sector or imbalances. It was not caused by a crisis of confidence in the financial sector. It was caused by a virus and a pandemic and forced shutdowns, okay, in the real economy. Mm. So very different situation. Now, what's similar is the Fed did step in. Uh, when we last spoke, the Fed was stepping in in a very big way. And I think that was positive. I give a lot of credit to the Fed and to other central banks, by the way, who have also done this to to inject liquidity. Another thing the Fed did that was very important was provide a backstop for the credit markets for court, which is a first, you know, for, for corporate bonds and basically said, look, we will stand behind you know, the, the, the credit of the, of, the, of the corporate sector, uh, which was a big statement. And that did a lot of good, okay? Having said that, this crisis is different. And so the Fed could do a lot, and it did, and it helped a lot, and it propped up markets a lot. But I think we start to reach a point, and I do get at this a little bit in this matrix, where the stimulus and the fiscal policy needs to step in, you know, for, for two reasons. One, because the Fed runs out of ammunition, right? And I think the Fed has largely run out of ammunition. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and secondly, because what's needed is to shore up people, consumers, businesses to make sure that they can keep people employed, people can continue to spend. And a good example of this is what's gone on in the U.S., which has been unfortunate, where stimulus packages have not been agreed for political reasons. They've been pushed forward and real people in their lives have suffered. And that has now had a knock-on effect and spending is declining and people are afraid, so they're holding back. And so there's a knock-on effect for the economy. And so I think this is something the Fed cannot help. And the example of that is the last Fed meeting, they said a couple of things. One was, one was uh, we're concerned about the economy. We're concerned a bit that the economy will slow down if the stimulus is not put in place because people are starting to suffer. Why did they say that? They said that because they can't fix that. They depend on, or we depend on Congress to fix that. So it was an urging saying, look, we can't do this. You need to do this. And I think that's a good example that right now, the stimulus is probably the most critical thing. The markets are reacting accordingly. You know, the market's rallying a bit this week because it looked like the stimulus is coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that will continue to be the case. So I think this crisis is different from 2008. I think the central bank has done a lot to provide a backstop and a jump start to the beginning of the year. And now really fiscal policy needs to take over. We need to get better at all of the COVID related measures to be able to pinpoint and allow businesses to continue to function. And hopefully that gets things back completely you know, on track or as, on track as much as possible. As to say one other thing, some industries will not be able to get back sooner rather than later without a lot of help. And the airline industry Mm -hmm. is a good example. Yesterday in the U.S., probably the largest layoffs in history took place in the airline industry. And, you know, those will be changed if there is a bailout or there is some money put forward. But that's kind of the place that we're in. If there's no demand then there's only two things that can happen. Either companies have a lot of capital in reserve and can last, which is often not the case, or there's a stimulus put in place to shore up the companies to allow them to maintain the employment levels to some reasonable degree, or what we saw yesterday, people will be released. Those are the only options. So again, the stimulus package is very important, and we should keep an eye on that. And I think the central bank will continue to push that uh, request publicly. Mm. Uh, just to uh, touch upon a little bit about the airlines industry, I think it's a very important um, um, case of when the company uh, companies that have 
some people say they have been efficient, some people say that they were not inefficient, but uh, is it a good way to maybe allow them to go bust and let uh, new people to acquire them? Place will not go away. Um, and then more new efficient people will come and take it over and then make it better. If, do you think is that the case? Shall, shall we allow them to go bust or should we keep and save them? Well, I guess this is a good example of it being an Adam Smith podcast, right? So Adam Smith, if you believe in the perfect workings of the free market, then what you just said, you know, this kind of Darwinist approach might be the case. Um, but the other side of it is, you know, that could happen over maybe more time, but, you know, you're talking about a lot of lives and a lot of uh, livelihoods. And, you know, the question really, uh, Vadim, I think is for each specific case, whether it's a company or an industry level, one has to make an assessment of, are these drops in demand somehow reflective of a longer term secular trend? Or are they really a short term or short to medium term reaction to the virus and the fear that it's causing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a better way I think of looking at it, which is, is it worth helping save certain companies? Because we think that it will on the one side, save jobs on the other side, you know, have them be able to stay viable as demand comes back. Right. So that I think is a way of framing it. If it's simply just to keep paying people for a business that's essentially going to fade, then maybe it makes less sense. So and I think that's on a case by case basis. But it's a it's a very difficult time um, to see tens and tens of thousands of people overnight uh, furloughed. Uh, so I think I think, you know, that is really fundamentally a political question. In each country, but those are some of the ways I think one could think about it. Good question. Got it. Got it. Um, so from we touched a little bit about uh, the elections and their effect on the market, and I, I would just uh, want to slowly migrate to that in that direction more to just to dig dig a little bit deeper. I think that everyone is looking at November and saying that it has many implications for the market mm -hmm. and. Let's just focus on what has happened, uh, what is happening there. From financial, uh, standpoint, uh, from financial market standpoint, one is that his, his historically elections has been always uh, been connected to the market. There's plenty of studies that come out that say 90 days before elections, uh, it often tells you who, which party is gonna win. So do you put any weight to this? And do you prepare in any way uh, in or like just to, to such a binary event when you know that there's either one or other candidate wins? Um, well, I mean, the first thing I would say is that didn't work in 2016, right? Mm. So 90 days before we expected one result and we got a different result. So that doesn't always work. Um, it's clear that the markets kind of build in expectations about what's likely to happen in the election. Um, you know, based on your question, you're talking about the US election in November. I mean, there's other elections, there's other important events like Brexit and other things that will have big impact on the, on the markets. Uh, but if we look at the US, um, you know, there is some expectation to date of who will win. There are, you know, there are polls and there are betting markets and the betting markets are often pretty, pretty, you know, pretty accurate. And uh, at this point, Biden is expected to win based on the very unfortunate news today about President Trump in COVID. That has become more so. Uh, his chances have been reduced further in betting markets. Um, but if you look towards the election, what do investors want to see? That Investors, I think, first and foremost, want to have some level of predictability. So, you know, I think that the idea that the election would be undecided, and I believe that probably will be the case for some period of time after November 3rd, is not a positive thing. The longer that it drags on, the more uncertainty is, is created. So that's not positive. Then if you look at the different outcomes, and again, um, they're not quite as binary uh, as you say. Yes, they're very different 
approaches. One big difference would be uh, China, which is factored hugely in financial markets and in, in U.S. economic performance, and and that has been a, a really sore issue. Um, and so the more uh, chance of Biden winning, there is some expectation that U.S. China relations could be in and I think that would be a positive for the markets. The other side, there is some expectation that a Biden presidency would mean um, higher taxes. Well, it certainly would. Uh, it would involve more regulation. It would have some form of environmentally friendly policies. Um, to mention a few things, these might not be entirely favorable for markets. Mm. Um, you know, but 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 you know they won't be implemented day one. Now, if the if the Democrats win the Senate as well and hold the House, then there's a good chance that markets will be a bit more concerned that some of these things might be accelerated. And by the way, just so everybody's clear, I'm talking specifically about how markets would react. That doesn't mean one or the other is better for the country. I personally hope Biden wins. That is my my hope. I think it would be much better for America, but that's a different point of view than 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 what's necessarily best for the markets in the in the short term. So, I guess we just keep monitoring um, the election, um, and uh, you know we're almost there. Um, and I th personally think we won't have a result immediately, and I think it will be a particularly messy process. Mm. And I don't say that with any pleasure whatsoever. Hopefully it will work out as uh, for the best for the country. That's my only um, hope. Uh, because uh, have you? Uh, by by the way, have you seen the the debates that has happened just the other day? And what's your viewpoint on them? Yes, I suffered through uh, an hour and a half of watching it, um, as did my wife with me. Um, it was not really a debate. Um, it was really an investment. Um, we didn't really learn anything new. Um, you know, I think what the president did was, was not presidential. Um, and, you know, I think it was, it was unfortunate. You know, we didn't learn nearly as much as we should have. Um, what I'm saying has been widely said in the press, so I'm not saying anything that hasn't been, you know, broadly stated across uh people and geographies and so on so I, I don't think we can call these debates and it looks like at this point we might not have the others i'm not sure it makes that much of a difference and by the way you know debates in an american context um have become increasingly less important because the country is so divided mm. so by the time the debates happen the level of uh undecided voters has dropped to such a low level that there's very few people listening uh, that are trying to make up their minds. You know, the country of the U.S. has changed where um, there are two parts of America and, and elections are decided in a few swing states, and it's not the whole country listening. Uh, you know, decades ago, you know, Ronald Reagan won 49 states in America, um, not Minnesota. Uh, but, uh, you know, that couldn't happen today it would be an impossibility. Um, so the country has changed and therefore the debates become more frankly about media and about positioning than about actual policy. They didn't really talk about policy the other day mm. to the extent they talked about anything apart from, yep. you know, Trump interrupting, you know. Yeah, taking over the debate if you, I don't think of a, we can yeah. use the word debate anymore. Such. Yeah, I, I'm being kind. I was kind of disgusted by what I saw, yeah. but there, there, there were some, there were some, you know, there were some uh, human moments, and, and I appreciated that. And you know, and and uh, I look, I'm a fan of Joe Biden as a, as a human being, and I think that came through in the debate. He said some very poignant human things about his son, about both of his sons, um, and he spoke to the American people. And I think we desperately need that. You know, I think the country is kind of starved of this kind of empathy and decency and emotion, you know, and I would be willing to bet that people watching this in the international community want to see the same thing, again, coming from 
from America. So I'm exposing my biases as I say this, uh, but I can't not do that. Mm. Um, so, Speaking of politics and just the world in itself, uh, I know that in 2005, you led the global study tour uh, where together with your first uh, year students of the executive MBA program of New York Stern School of Business, uh, you went to Russia. Uh, you went there for an immersive one week program where you met with leaders of the industry, financial institutions and government organizations. As part of the program, you require students to submit a briefing book about Russia, currency savings, uh, foreign investments and natural resources, as well as politics. Um, can you please talk about your findings back then and maybe reflect a bit on how it has changed? Because we can see a lot of uh, Russia playing more of a global player context as a bully uh, in one way or another, like especially with the, with the way it treats opposition nowadays with Navalny being in uh, Germany, mm -hmm. healing and all, all those things. So we, we didn't have the, that in 2005. So how had... How did it change? Wow. Um, you know, thank you for bringing up what for me is a very happy memory, you know, taking, you know, those 27 uh, very bright and curious people to Moscow uh, and to St. Petersburg uh, was a big, uh, you know, was a wonderful experience for me uh, and I hope for, for them. Um, you know, there are many things one can say to contrast, you know, Russia in 2005 versus today, uh, many different things. Um, and it's changed not only from those two points, but along the way, you know, I lived in Moscow from 2010 to 2013. And again, it was, was different. But I'll try to offer a few ideas. I honestly don't remember what was in the briefing book, but I'll talk about my own impressions. You know, in 2005, you had a Russia that was growing, becoming more serious about business. Um, you know, that was right on the cusp of years of record levels of IPOs of Russian companies, a lot of wealth creation, um, a lot of international expansion, um, including by Russia's wealth, you know, branching out, buying properties, you know, getting into places like the UK and others and beginning that. So the diaspora was kind of, was, was forming then. Um, you know, Russia had at the time a, a reasonable geopolitical position. There were not quite the levels of conflicts uh, that, that have emerged over these years. Uh, and I would also add that oil was a bit uh, higher in those days. You know, it wasn't at 100 but it was certainly not at 40. It was probably, I'm guessing, somewhere in the 60s then. So there was more to work with. Russia was in a stronger uh, position. If we, if we fast forward to today, um, I think it's a very different uh, Russia, you know, in, in for a lot of different reasons. You know, firstly, uh, it's a much less uh, internationally oriented country in, in, in business and financial terms. Um, you know, those days there were many IPOs. Now there, there are none really uh, abroad. Um, you know, so that changed dramatically. Access to international capital markets um, because of sanctions has gone away. Uh, so, you know, and then from that, I think Russia has become a bit, and, and, and again, it's very hard to characterize a country. And I'm, I'm talking more about the feeling you have spending time there and the feeling that you get from the leadership of Russia. It's become a more Russian country. There's more focus inward on Russian history, Russian nostalgia, Russia's position in the world, you know, Russia, uh, which by a lot of accounts, you know, does punch beyond its weight uh, in geopolitical terms. You know, the Middle East is a good example. And, and for that, I give it credit. It's managed to, you know, to play a big role in certain parts of the world. Uh, the trade-off has been uh, an economic trade-off. And so I think that, you know, what one might have hoped in those years uh, to see developed and grown, and, and it did continue, you know, when I lived in Moscow, there was a lot of talk of Russia, uh, of Moscow becoming a global financial center. And I participated in some discussions with, with government and, and business uh, people about that. 
you know, to create Moscow as a financial center, to open up capital markets, to put in place the framework and the infrastructure to, to, to do business on a global scale. Um, and unfortunately, for a lot of different reasons, and, and you know, I, I would prefer, you know, it's a country I, I, I hold in very dear, and so I would not want to get into a discussion necessarily about Navalny, that's very unfortunate. Um, and, but, but over the course of these years, while Russia has punched above its weight geopolitically, in PR terms, it's, it's gotten into some, some problems, you know, beginning with Ukraine, um, some of the, the issues around the U.S. and the U.S. election process, um, more recently with Navalny, some of the issues with the U.K. And so I think Russia has become more isolated, uh, certainly politically, uh, but I think also economically, you know, and I think that that's unfortunate and it's unfortunate mostly for young Russians who are trying to, you know, build their careers and get into, you know, good productive areas and industries. You know, at the same time, the country has also uh, become much more state owned. If you look at the industrial base, you look at the corporate. So all of these trends, you know, being more closed in, being more state-owned overall, have not led to a thriving kind of innovative economy. And so, you know, I think Russia has tried over the years to do things like just in, you know, 2005 was just before they created Skolkova, mm -hmm. um, where I, you know, I had lectured at a certain point and I knew the folks very well there. And there was so much promise, both Skolkova as a, as a, as a learning center and as a and as a as an incubator for uh, you know for for early stage companies so there was this kind of silicon valley approach. and unfortunately it just didn't kind of uh, get to where it needs to be uh, for a lot, lot of reasons and so my hope for Russia is you know it's been the same hope for many years is that you know there can be a push to structurally change the economy to diversify both the ownership and the sectoral imbalances economy depends on resources, uh, I'm not saying anything that anybody listening is not familiar with. So there's nothing new in what I'm saying. But it does, since you posed the question, raise a tremendous contrast for what, from what I remember in 2005 and then the years following that. Um, and so I would hope there's a way back. I'm not sure that there is anytime soon, you know, and that's, 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 that's unfortunate. Indeed. Um one of the uh, questions that I um, want to start asking all of the people who participate in our podcast mm -hmm. is uh, you, you touched upon um, Taleb's uh, Black Swan, but uh, are there any other, can you recommend our listeners two books that uh, you read and changed maybe your perspective on the world or left the impact, le left an emotion, something that touched you and something that you would recommend others to read? to view the world like you do. Well, well thanks, thanks for the question, Vadim. Um, you know, I, I try these days to read as much as I can. A um, Couple of books that I found very, very useful. You know, one is How to Get to a Positive No. And the author's name has gone out of my mind, but I'm sure you can find it and put it in the, uh, in the notes. Yep. Um, Fabulous book um, by a Harvard professor who years ago wrote How to Get to Yes. Um, and, you know, the world has changed and we're so overwhelmed. And I'm sure this is true for many people listening. We're so overwhelmed with requests and, and questions and demands and things that it becomes increasingly hard to say no. And many of us are bad at it. And this book, and I just recommended it to a good friend who, who found it very great, but highly recommend it because it helps you formulate how to get, get to know in a positive way. So how to pro pro project your interests and still come out with a good outcome for both parties. And I really recommend that. I think that's been, uh, been very, very helpful to read. Um, a second book. Hmm. There's, there's, there's quite a few, um, you know, 
I'll just, I'll not talk about uh, the world. The book that comes to mind that I just read is a book called Breathe. Um, fascinating book by uh, James, I want to say James Nestor, um, about breathing and how important it is to our lives. And, you know, uh, you know, I spend a fair bit of time looking at kind of life hacks and I read books and I try to find ways to feel better. If we feel better, we're more productive, we, we do a service to ourselves and to us. Um, and breathing properly in the morning, I do a number of breathing things. Um, his book looks at a lot of research and a lot of these dreams and just basic things like if you breathe through your nose and not through your mouth, it's tremendously better for you. Just a very basic thing. And many people don't know that. Mm -hmm. And then there's ways you can cultivate your breathing. But you know, I think we spend so much time focused on just analyzing things. I think sometimes we need to stop and analyze ourselves. And so people listening, especially in these times of, of pandemics and things, I think these little improvements we can make to our quality of life um, really set us up. So, you know, learning about breathing, having better, better breathing habits in my daily routines has been a really positive thing. So breathe is the life hack to help everybody. Uh, and then, you know, how to get to a positive no will, mm. will I think, improve your negotiating skills and, and free up your schedule and give you more time to be creative and productive and so on. That's my message to everybody. Sounds incredible. Uh, the, the special of the brief one is, you know, while you breathe, you're alive, you still breathe and you die. So it's something that people forget, the breathing, how, how important it is to our lives. So incredible, incredible suggestions. Uh, I think I will have to check them both out. But other than that, uh, is there anything that you would like to touch upon that we didn't touch it in this podcast? No, look, I, I think, you know, I mean, again, thanks to you. you. You always do such a good job of preparing and asking intelligent, well-formulated questions and really covering a variety of topics. So you make my job a lot easier. All I have to do is just respond a bit. So thank you for continuing to, to, to really put in the work and make these discussions productive. Um, the only thing I suppose I would say is that I didn't say at the outset is, mm. you know, everybody that's listening, um, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're managing as best as possible in the, you know, the times we live in, that your health is in good place, that your work is in the as best a place as possible. It's not been an easy year uh, to do our business. You know, I haven't been on an airplane and since February, um, you know, some somebody was flying the other day and I sent a note and said, have a good flight, send air, send photos of the airport. I forgot <laughs> what they looked like, you know. So um, uh, I, sure enough, I'll, I'm sure I'll not be I'll be reminded again. But but, you know, I just would say, you know, I think we're all doing our best to kind of muddle through this year and survive both, you know, kind of physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, and so that would be the one thing I would want to say to everybody. You know, I truly hope, you know, as fellow human beings that you're all okay. Um, thanks for taking time, you know, to listen. Uh, I hope, you know, you've gleaned something from this. And, you know, in future, I'm always happy to you know, visit with you, Vadim, and, and have another conversation. Hopefully when we're in phase three and we're doing well, that would be great. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, everybody, who stayed with us to listen to this. Uh, you can find all the information about Greg, his website, and his contact details in the description of this video. Uh, and thank you very much to you, Greg, for this discussion. It's always a pleasure, and there's so much learning going on after each uh, our, of our conversations. And yes, thank you very much. And I hope we stay in contact and connect once we will be in stage three. That'd be great. Vadim, thank you again ever so much. And all the best to you, especially, and to everybody. 